I guess we have, um, I want to welcome you all to our seminar uh, series. Uh, it's an year to say um, seminar that uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Nagachi uh, Kondu. Um, he, he was in our nano center at Harvard for four years as a postdoc. He got his K99 funded and then he moved on to uh, University of Texas in Tyler, right? Yes. Um, he's an assistant professor there for the last three years. Yes. Am I correct? Yes. The, so I, I will keep the introduction short. But, um, yeah, and I'm delighted that he's here and um, he, he has a very diverse background. He's a veterinarian by training and he came to the US, uh, did his PhD. University of Pittsburgh uh, on nanotoxicology. Then he came to MIT and Harvard with a PhD. Uh, I mean, a postdoc um, in nanotoxicology in our nano center there. Uh, so, um, and I'm delighted to see that he's moving in, in uh, new areas. He's into uh, um, biomarkers of lung disease. Uh, and of course, EVs, it's the center of vesicles, it's, it's a kind of an emerging area uh, for, for biomarkers, and uh, he's gonna, I assume he's gonna present his work on, on this emerging area today. So, Nagashi, welcome to Rutgers and Yukasai, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Phil, uh, for this uh, kind introduction. And um, I am extremely delighted uh, and honored to be here in this talk all today and to share uh, some of my research. Uh, and, uh, please feel free to interrupt any time during the presentation because your comments and feedback is very, very important. So, but am I audible? Um, it's all good. Am I audible? Yes, we can hear it. Excellent. We have this music on the background, but. Um, uh, yes, that, that's why I shut this off. <laughs> it's a little bit hot. Yeah. So, um, but just to give a brief overview of my presentation today, I will talk about you know my research, and give some background, uh, and also scientific premise why we are doing uh, what we are doing and you know, why this is important. Um, and then um, I will introduce you, you know, uh, to our uh, uh, biomarker story linking uh, one particular cohort that is the beryllium as a state as a proof of concept. And then uh, to see how we are discovering biomarkers in exosomes, and then taking it to the next level, you know, to uh, develop the ELISA, um, you know, based assays based on the proteins that we discover on exosomes, uh, so that you know they can be applied to uh, large-scale uh, uh, epidemiological studies. <clears throat> and then I will uh, talk about you know our progress towards concentrating. Uh, exosomes that are originating in lung, because uh, you know one of the challenges that uh, people are uh, posing is that you know you're talking about exosomes in peripheral circulation, which come from you know, all different tissues. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please mute your mics. <laughs> Those of you zooming in, please mute. <laughs> yeah, and and so so we were confronted with this question. Pretty good, you? Please mute your mics. No, she's not here. She, I mean, she started the whole thing, but she's not here. She's out. All right. And and so uh, we have progressed uh, significantly towards you know developing. Um, uh, membrane probe markers that are kind of like originating from lung cells and then trying to do immunocapturing of these um, vesicles uh, in uh, um, blood. Yes, so that you know, we can now track what's going on in, inside the lung uh, by looking at you know, specifically focused on these vesicles that are originating from lung. And then um, I'll talk about um, uh, the rat silicosis model to evaluate these uh, lung cell specific changes, and then also uh, talk about single cell RNA sequencing data, which we've been using to understand the concordance between the exosome proteome data uh, from the peripheral circulation and uh, you know, linking it to the lung transcriptome. Yeah, 
Okay. You may want to slide up in your tie a little bit. Uh huh. Thank you. Right here. <clears throat> I hope I'm audible now. Yeah. And then I'll also uh, uh, talk about uh, my future studies, uh, grantsmanship, and potential collaborations here throughout this. So let me begin with an expression of thank you uh, to my wonderful mentor, Joe Bain at Harvest for Public Health, you know, who uh, has been uh, continuously supporting me both uh, in my scientific endeavors, as well as in my personal life, you know, from time to time, advising me on my research. Um, and, and to all my collaborators, you can see Lisa Meyer from uh, the National Jewish Hospital in Colorado. So she has been helping us with the uh, beryllium study, providing all the samples that are needed. Uh, and, and that's the work that I'm going to talk about today. And then Lisa Miller um, at UC Davis, we have been collaborating her, with her uh, on the uh, wildfire smoke exposures, uh, particularly in a monkey colony, and then trying to see how the exosome uh, profiles can predict the lung dysfunction you know, in these monkeys. Um, and then uh, George Johannan in Germany has been helping us with the uh, asbestos study. We've been looking at asbestos exposures in, uh, in occupation. Um, and, and here's a huge cohort of 2,500 you know, subjects uh, with different uh, disease stages. Um, and then uh, Ivan Rosas, who was formerly at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, now is the chief of pulmonary division at Baylor. So we have been collaborating the, on uh, the IPF project, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And there's a clinical uh, challenge there. And that's why you know, we both got together in terms of the diagnosis of IPF. There is no you know, straightforward diagnosis. And so we wanted to develop biomarkers that can uh, discriminate IPF from other non ipf like conditions that kind of like confound in terms of that diagnosis. So I'm going to talk about uh, some of the data there as well. Uh, with Stephen Backer at Netherlands, we have been studying chronic kidney disease and uh, you know how to differentiate it from chronic kidney disease with unknown etiology that's very becoming very uh, prevalent in uh, Latin America and uh, um, Asian continents. Uh, the Pat Ryan at Cincinnati, uh, we have been collaborating on lead exposures in pediatric populations. Um, and and uh, Jeff Miller is our uh, in house uh, bioinformatician. He was in house at Harvard, but then you know, we continue to collaborate, and he has been you know, designing all the, uh, the statistical and bioinformatic aspects of my research. Um, lastly, you know, my very passionate and uh, you know, um, uh, driven postdoc, Dr. Aduri, uh, whose results I'm going to present today, and uh, my research associate, Karen Velasco. So these two people, you know, have been running the show essentially for me. Lastly, the funding agencies, NIEHS, and uh, the pilot funding from the uh, Health Science Center. So the overarching goal of our research is to develop new approaches uh, to unravel the molecular mechanisms underlying the uh, adverse health effects uh, from exposures. And off late, we have been interested in uh, discovery and development of biomarkers uh, to construct the periodic table of exposures and effects. You know, it's, it's a huge project you know, that I've entered into, but I realized that there was a need and somewhere we have to start. You know. And so, uh, before I get to my research, you know, to give you some background, now this slide actually <coughs> illustrates the fact that two thirds of all people die of chronic diseases, you know, mostly cardiovascular diseases and cancer. And these diseases are caused by a combination of genes and exposome, which I will uh, get to very shortly. Um, most importantly, you know. Half of the deaths in this uh, category are attributable to exposures. The past two decades or so, scientists have spent an enormous amount of time and effort in understanding 
the genetic basis of uh, diseases, only to realize that the contribution from genes is relatively modest. As you can see, it's only 15% uh, coming from the genes. Uh, the rest, 85%, is coming from environment. And now we, we call it as exposome. And exposome is uh, defined as the totality of all exposures and individual encounters from conception onwards and how these exposures actually determine the health of the individual. This, uh, this concept was introduced by Christopher Weil in uh, 2005. And I saw today morning a book uh, in the shelf of Dr. Zabel. So I believe it was uh, from Gary Miller, yeah. yes, and so, yes, who is right now in Colombia. But the, the key challenge is how do you measure you know, all these exposures? And so I was actually attracted to this challenge. Uh, and, and so my, my mentor, Joe Brain, would always ask me, well, you know, Nagarjun, you know, you're talking about exposome. So uh, what is the approach that you would be taking? Would you be taking a splitter's approach or a lumper's approach? You know, and so I would say that, no, you know, either way is, is, is not possible. Somewhere you have to compromise. And so maybe a middle path, you know, would be better. And so, you know, if you look at, you know, our capabilities right now, state of the art, in assessing genetic factors in epidemiology, we have grown exponentially. As you can see, you know, since the inception of the Human Genome Project, now we are able to characterize uh, 20 billion genotypes in one stretch on 20,000 subjects, isn't it? So it's amazing you know, how we have progress. But on the other hand, you know, if you look at uh, measuring exposures, you're still hooked up to uh, some of the old you know, techniques. <clears throat> wherein we are relying on questionnaires and personal interviews and so on and so forth. So you know, it, there should be something more that can be done. And then that's where I was uh, trying to look for an opportunity. And so we have been interested in biomarkers that can help us open this black box and can um, you know, provide biomarkers that can actually define the boundaries on this exposure disease continuum. Because there are no boundaries as such now. So, but then we wanted to ask, you know, can these biomarkers be developed that can set as milestones you know, at different stages um, and then provide you know, information on the health status of the individual um, after exposures happen? But then, um, you know, and then construct a periodic table of exposures. So, we started with, uh, you know, four uh, uh, exposures uh, beryllium, asbestos silica and lead. And then we wanted to, you know, to see if exosomes can actually provide these biomarkers. Uh, initially, we were actually, you know, we were asked, okay, where do you look for these biomarkers? You know, and, and uh, what is the uh, biospecimen that you would look for? So the most sought after is blood and plasma. As you can see, it's not feasible to go and collect tissues, especially for large epidemiological studies. But there are inherent challenges with discovering biomarkers in blood or asthma. As you can see, you have all of these major abundant proteins like albumin, immunoglobulins, and so on and so forth, that would obscure the biomarker discovery. Because your biomarkers are present in very low abundant levels. And so, you know, it's like um, listening to a whispered conversation at the end of the street corner when you have a loud concert you know, going on. So these, these uh, uh, inherent challenges actually force us to think, okay, this should be an alternative, you know, and then we moved into extracellular vesicles. Okay. So extracellular vesicles, you have two uh, you know, categories here. You have the micro vesicles and you have exosomes, which have you know, different origins in a cell, as you can see in the schema. So the exosomes actually are formed from the uh, platinum coated vesicle, you know, to the platinum uh, coated vesicle formation. Uh, into the end, early endosome, and they form these multivascular bodies. And then, uh, you know, the cell releases them into the extracellular space. Uh, but then you can also see that, you know, some of these multivascular bodies are sent to lysosomes, which is here. We do not know, uh, you know, currently, under what circumstances the cell determines the fate of these vesicles, you know, whether to send them into the extracellular space or to send them into degradation. We don't know. You know how the cell does. Um, and then there is these microvesicles that are formed by budding on the surface of the plasma membrane. 
Um, so we are interested in exosomes, which you know range from uh, 35 nanometers to 150 nanometers in their size. And I'll, I'll come why we are interested in these particular vesicles. And most cells in the body actually release them on a daily basis. So you can expect around 5,000, 15,000 vesicles. So you can consider them as a nanobiopsy material of a cell. You know? So as long as you have the toxic end, you know, they're acting on the cell. So these uh, signatures will end up in the exosomes. And you know, in this in this uh, cartoon, you can see that um, you know if one is interested in biomarkers, you have all the ingredients that you need for biomarker discovery. You have proteins, you have lipids, you have metabolites, you have RNA, and so on and so forth. So you know, it's it's a it's a wonderful uh, uh, resource for biomarkers. So the question that we have been interested in is, you know, can we map backwards EV signatures to exponents? And to address that, you know, and our hypothesis is that uh, the EV biomarkers can enable classification of exposures and that EV profiling can aid in early detection of molecular events that precede the onset of late occurring chronic diseases. And to achieve this, so uh, we isolate exosomes and we are particularly interested in uh, proteins in these exosomes. So there are several groups that have been looking at exosomes. For example, uh, the Andrea Bacteriales group at Columbia, they have been interested in microRNAs and they've been studying you know, air pollution, lead exposures, but particularly you know, looking at microRNAs. And uh, Chandler's group uh, at Harvard has been studying microvesicles. But you know, I wanted to take a different route. You know, I've, I've, I've grown up seeing these two individuals, so I said, okay, let me, let me you know, look into proteins because you know, we, I was looking for something that can be uh, developed as in the down the lane, you know, as an easy to doubt assay, you know, for doing large scale studies. So the four uh, cohorts that uh, I have access to, and we have now almost thousands of samples altogether uh, in this is uh, beryllium uh, exposure cohort from uh, National Jewish Hospital, uh, asbestos cohort, both from Libby Montana and as well as in Germany. And then silica dust from Netherlands and um, and uh, um, India, and then lead exposure. Uh, the pediatric population is from uh, Cincinnati, University of Cincinnati. And today's data I'm going to present is from the beryllium study. You know, it's going to be the proof of concept stuff. So here is some data, you know, which is looking at the preliminary characterization of the exosomes from this uh, beryllium cohort. So we isolate exosomes from the plasma using size exclusion chromatography. And then you know, we characterize them. As you can see, uh, most of these vesicles, they fall in the category of you know, 100 nanometers and size of that. Um, and then uh, this is a cryo-electron micrograph you know, showing these barrels. And so you can appreciate the bilipid layer of these vesicles. You know? And micro vesicles don't have it. And so that's the distinction from exosomes. So exosomes have this typical um, uh, lipid bilayer. And then we also have these markers that are kind of like classic to exosomes. Um, so one is this HSP70. There are actually guidelines now set by the International Society uh, for Extracellular Vesicles. And uh, if you want to call them exosomes, then you have to have all these markers you know, characterized. And so as you can see, our samples are enriched in exosomes and not microvesicles. And so they have all these markers. Uh, CD9 is uh, an external <coughs> membrane protein. Um, Alex is internal. And then we need to also show an, uh, a negative marker, which is the calnexin. So most importantly, on the right, you can see that you know, as uh, a dimension reduction analysis, you can see that the proteome profile between exposed and unexposed is very, very different. So you see they're very separated on the principal component analysis, which this is the first step, which gives you confidence to move forward with biomarker analysis. Means that you know you have distinct protein profiles, and now you can go ahead and look for biomarkers that are unique to the exposure group. So here is the workflow of our biomarker discovery. We usually um, separate uh, the, the cohort into two groups. One is the discovery cohort, and then uh, you know, we have the validation cohort. On the discovery cohort, usually we uh, take an untargeted 
uh, proteomics approach. We look at the global proteins you know, by mass spectrometry and then uh, perform um, cross-validation there and then a lab regression analysis to identify biomarkers that can uh, differentiate between exposed and unexposed. And then once we have identified the candidate uh, proteins, then we validate them by ELISAs on an independent cohort. So that's the strategy that we have been taking. So as you can see, initially, you know, when we do mass spectrometry, there are 954 proteins. Then you start there. And then uh, we perform differential expression analysis, and then it, it ends up with 55 and 31 down proteins in case of the variolian cohort. But then, uh, you know, in, in terms of, uh, you know, ELISA, we're very interested in upregulated protein because this is easy to detect, isn't it? And, and, and so we only pick the upregulated proteins and then perform lasso regression analysis to be able to identify the biomarkers. And so that um, gave us two proteins that could differentiate you know, between an exposed and an exposed. And those are the candidate names. And then we validate them again in uh, independent cohort. So here is the last regression analysis and the feature selection here in case this is the biomarker selection. And these are the two proteins uh, that uh, were kind of like the best predictors of the disease. Sorry, the exposure. And this is the ELISA data validating you know, these markers in independent cohort. As you can see, there's a, there's a clear difference uh, between expo unexposed and exposed, and, and, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and then we asked the next question was, you know, can it also stratify individuals based on the exposure level? It's not just yes or no in terms of exposure, but you know, can also so. Uh, can they also um, you know, stratify the individuals you know, based on their exposure level? And that's the lower panel data here. And as you can see, um, there is there's a good you know, um, demarcation between low exposure level and high exposure, exposure level with the, uh, these proteins. And the AUR curves also seem to be pretty decent. You know, here, in terms of exposure, yes or no, it's 91.9% 9 efficacy. That's outstanding. And then uh, in terms of you know, low and high, it's 72.5. Anything above 70% is, is, is very good. And uh, the next question that we want to answer is that, well, can you also identify biomarkers uh, that can discriminate between different disease states you know, um, in, this, in these uh, individuals that were exposed and developed you know, uh, disease? And so here we have, you know, in case of beryllium, there are two disease conditions that, you know, the clinicians are worried about. And one is the beryllium sensitization, and the other one is the chronic beryllium disease, which is more of a lung fibrosis. And so again, we ask the question, you know, can we identify a biomarker that discriminates between these two disease states? And as you can see, so we identified this protein, television molecule one in the exosomes. Um, that did a pretty decent job, but only thing is that it's it's a down-regulated protein. As you can see, it's down-regulated uh, when uh, the individual develops CBD as opposed to beryllium sensitization. But again, the AUR auto curves show that it's, it's pretty decent in its performance. So, you know, I am actually in a hospital uh, setting. You know, we are at the health science center, and most of the individuals there. Are clinicians who've been interested in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and there is a challenge there, and that is, you know, how to differentiate IPF from other IPF-like conditions like uh, CHP, which is called the chronic hypersensitive pneumonitis, and non-specific interstitial pneumonitis, and there's also sarcoidosis. Some of you may know this, this disease, and so there's a big challenge there. And so we asked again, can exosomes you know, provide the biomarkers that can differentiate between IPF and other ILDs? And as you can see, we identified a three protein signature here uh, consisting of TN TLN1, Talmodulin5, and HMGB1. And uh, you know, it's outstanding. And we've even filed a patent on, on this discovery. And this uh, study is fortunately accepted uh, also in Forex Journal. What, what, what is the HMG? Uh, what is that one? That's a uh, homeobox uh, protein, HMGB1. Yeah. It's actually implicated in, in uh, IPF. There are several studies that have implicated 
and we were lucky to find that in our uh, biomarker panel. Did you find any other inflammatory proteins? Any inf other inflammatory? Yes. Proteins? So because the question was on biomarkers, so <laughs> uh, but then there are these, you know, um, different types of proteins that we looked at. Um, like the next slide here will show you. So there's a huge EV protein on. You know, information and the question was again if we have you know in public domain uh, the single cell transcriptome data for IPF and so we asked okay to what extent does the EV protein mirror you know the the transcriptome data and as you can see 60 percent or there was about 60 percent overlap between the protein data and then you know the lung transcriptome data so that means that it gives us confidence that you know EVs are a very good source uh, to identify biomarkers as, and also to identify molecular pathways related to you know a disease so our findings so far tell us that you know ev biomarkers can classify you know exposures and that uh, evs are a, a great source for biomarker discovery for especially for lung disease have you looked at the origin of the evs right that is where you know our next efforts are so because for biomarker, it doesn't matter uh, you know, where they are coming from, but yeah, we were confronted with that question, and that's why we got into that. Uh, and so then the next question was, can we you know, uh, concentrate lung cell-specific exosomes in, in, uh, in circulation? Yeah. So you have all these cells that are releasing exosomes, like, as I said, you know, on a daily basis, which they enter into blood circulation. So can we uh, you know, identify a transmembrane protein that is unique to exosomes originating from the lung cells and that can be used for immunocapturing you know these lung cell specific exosomes in the circulation so that that was you know the, the question and so we actually identified this protein slc 34 a 2 and so it's a major breakthrough but you know we are far away with, with the confirming this um so and, and the strategy that we uh, took was okay, so we have access to brown fall large fluid from patients, and we also have plasma from the same patients. And then, so what we did was we isolated the exosomes and then processed just their membranes. That's why it's called surface ion. So we are only looking at, you know, whatever that is membrane and membrane bound. It could be also proteins that are, you know, kind of just attached to these membrane proteins. And then uh, would remove those surface other proteins and then fractionate them into three different fractions. Uh, aqueous, which will include the most uh, you know, hydrophilic proteins, transmembrane proteins. Uh, the detergent will have the hydrophobic ones and a mixed population of both this in the insoluble fractions. And then perform mass spectrometry. As you can see, you now in total, uh, between the bal exosome and plasma exosomes, we identified 1,945 proteins, uh, membrane proteins, membrane associated proteins. And then next we filter them down by asking, okay, now exclude that are highly expressed in two or more other issues. So that brought down the number to 261. And then, you know, further excluded them asking, okay, which one is highly expressed in lung and then which has a tenfold higher on so on and so forth. But the question is that, you know, we want a membrane protein that is present both in BAL, exosomes, and plasma, because your ultimate goal is to isolate exosomes from the circulation, from the blood, isn't it? And so it turns out that there was only one protein that was commonly present in both, and that was this SLC34A2. It's a sodium channel protein. And so we zeroed in, and it has, it's highly expressed in 82 and 81 cells. It's the alpha type two and alpha type one cells as well. So, and then we perform the minimal labeling of EVs for this protein. And as you can see, you know, we have uh, the protein being present on the surface of exosomes. But this is only one uh, you know, technique. We actually are employing other techniques to confirm this, this finding. But it's not always good to just rely on one technique. And then, uh, you know, the other simple experiments that we did was like, okay, let's isolate exosomes from bowel fluid and see for the expression by Western blot. As you can see, you know, the protein is present and the plasma, it's, it's faint, but it is present, which makes sense that, you know, in the plasma, 
these vesicles will be diluted and so you'll end up having less protein that and then uh, you know a549 uh, is an alpha epithelial cell line and so we wanted you know to understand if these exosomes have this protein and so as you can see there's a sort of very nice band here and they said okay let's do another cell that doesn't express you know this and so we picked thp1 for the um, uh, macrophage cell line and then the exosomes that I, that I isolated from this cell line did not have this protein so so there are some large implications of this discovery you know uh, as you may know 82 cells are implicated in in lung cancer you know particularly the lung adenocarcinoma the origin is type 2 cells and so if there is a way that we can actually you know isolate the lung cells 82 cell specific exosomes and then monitor them you know as the uh, disease initiates and progresses that would be actually a valuable uh, But then, you know, the, the, the challenge is, you know, we need to identify a smoker cohort, you know, 20, the, the 20, 30 years of uh, sample collection, three years of sample collection that we can prospectively, you know, uh, evaluate. And so there are, there are cohorts and actually in, at the University of Pittsburgh, but, you know, we have just reached this point and so we'll have to convince them that here's a story, you know, can you provide your samples for us uh, to look at, you know, markers that can predict the development of lung cancer early in these patients. But then we did a simple experiment, and this is, you know, a very preliminary and work in progress. And that is, you know, we um, took the rat silicosis model. We know that, you know, we'll be capturing SLC3482. And then uh, the goal was, okay, you know, perform single cell RNA trans and uh, transcript and uh, single cell RNA sequencing on these uh, uh, tissues. Uh, and then isolate different cell types, and then also compare the lung uh, cell transcriptome data to the EV proteome data. I'm feeling a little hot. Is it okay yeah. if I remove mine? Yeah. Sorry. <clears throat> so here is our uh, exposure system, and so here we can accommodate six rats at a time. And so we exposed six rats to silica dust uh, at the level of uh, 30 milligram uh, per meter cube. And then uh, this was done six hours a day, five days a week, eight weeks exposure. And so it's 40 days of exposure. And then you give another 80 days of lack period time for the fibrosis to develop. And so uh, this is this model we adopted from the NIOSH, you know, and, and so, and we would collect periodically the, uh, the plasma. Uh, and the goal is, again, to isolate exosomes and see how the exosome profile changes as a function of dose and time. And then, you know, if they mirror the uh, lung transcriptome data that we get from the single cell RNA sequence. And so here is the, the CT scans on these, uh, these rats. And so at the end of uh, 120 days, as you can see, there's a clear fibrosis you know, developed and the, the lung volumes have uh, dramatically reduced. Um, and uh, as you can see, the trichrome staining, uh, there is a lot of fibrosis in this lens. And uh, we also perform BAL analysis uh, to look at you know, the different markers in different immune cells. As you can see, there's a big difference between silica exposed and, and uh, controlled rats. Under more than 100 million cells actually in the bowel. And most of these cells actually are neutrophils, as you can see, they are both uh, activated and inactivated uh, neutrophils. Uh, so here is the number, CD43 is considered to be more of active neutrophil. Um, and then you have, uh, you know, made out of all these immune cells. Excuse me. Yes. Were those silica exposed the animals or animals with silicosis? These were animals with silicosis. Yes, this is the end of uh, you know the sacrifice analysis. Yes. Okay, thanks. And is this distribution of cells typical for silicosis or? Yes, okay. that's correct. Yes, you know, it's, a, it's a full blown silicosis model. Okay, so and yeah. so, and you can only you know do lavage in, in sacrifice animals. So we did only at the end. I'm sorry, what was the timing at the end? So it's after 120 days. 
Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big experiment. And how much I missed the frequency of exposure? So it's every day for six hours, five days a week for uh, 40 days at 30 milligrams per minute. <laughs> Have you seen silica particles in the glass? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, that's crystalline silica. Yes. It's got from the Minsil 5, yeah, which Nyon provided to us. And I'm sorry, go back a second. So, this is in VAL. This you is in VAL. Yes. But the tissue is really a better reflection of what's going on in ecology than the VAL. Right, and so we are evaluating for, uh, using histopathology. Yeah. I don't have, that's why I, I mentioned this as work in progress and it's very preliminary right now. Uh, but I will, I'm just sharing the, the overall you know, goal of this project was to look at the EV proteome and compare the long transcription. So here is the single cell data, and then you know, we have all these cells um, that we identify, and you can see there's a big chunk coming from the immune cells here. And there are epithelial cells, which mostly are 82 cells, you know, which is what we want. And this is the cell type that we are interested in because of the SLC32 protein. Uh, and then the stromal cells are the fibroblasts. And then you have the endothelial cells. And so um, here is uh, just the uh, 82 cell population. As you can see, it's, big, it's, it's very different between control and silica. The red is the control, and then uh, the green the green is, is more of the silica cells. And so they have very different profiles. <clears throat> and you have other you know, different cell types, as you can see here. You have the ciliated population, you have the clock cells, and so on and so forth. And most importantly, our goal is to identify these uh, uh, gene modules you know, that are correlative, and then also the cell clusters, um, so that you know, we can compare the changes in these cells to the uh, EV proteome data. And this is uh, uh, you know, a schema that shows the hub genes in module seven. And um, so we are, it's, it's work in progress. It's very you know, uh, early to tell you know, which pathways they are, they are affected and so on. So, but I just wanted to give you a gist of you know, where we, the direction that we are, we are taking. And so the, the key question still remains, uh, which is you know, to what extent the SLC 34 a to positive EVs mirror the AB2 cell transcription. So future studies um, will look at you know, applying these biomarkers for uh, characterizing exposures in populations lacking exposure information. We submitted a grant uh, last October looking at uh, asbestos exposure in, uh, in a cohort from Libby, Montana, where the uh, exposure information is either lacking or uh, it's uh, it's uh, not complete, and and also you know we are looking at uh, uh, lead exposures in pediatric populations and trying to identify biomarkers that can stratify individuals based on their exposure level. And uh, again, we are interested in biomarker validations for kidney disease, um, particularly you know that can dis discriminate between CKD and CKDU, um, and we are in the process of constructing this uh, database. A variety of exposures, which I talked about on the periodic table of exposures. Um, and then uh, we also are interested in understanding the role of AVs in the pathogenesis of lung diseases, um, particularly, uh, you know, ILDs. And also, we're looking at uh, exosomes as carriers of uh, uh, environmental toxins, particularly heavy metals, which we identified recently that, you know, they were present in these exosomes. But we are doing um, uh, microscopic techniques to be able to you know, show uh, the ultrastructural localization of this metal in EVs, which is very, very important. So in terms of uh, grantsmanship and finding you know, collaborations here, so as I said, we, we submitted this, this grant. Uh, and then uh, we're also looking at you know, another uh, grant on uh, reporter using this uh, exosome reporter mice. Uh, to, to look at the communication between gut, lung, and brain and see, you know, when uh, the, the animals are exposed to these metals, you know, is there a higher influx of exosome secretion and where do they go from, you know, the, the primary target size, either through the gut or the lung, you know, and are they entering 
uh, the brain and cross it by crossing the blood brain barrier and so on and so forth. So this will actually you know, uh, address several uh, questions related to translocation of metals, which is uh, unexplored from the context of exosomes. Uh, we have a pilot grant from uh, the California National Primary Research Center looking at uh, exosomes for predicting uh, lung dysfunction in a, a colony of uh, monkeys that were actually exposed to wildfire smoke in 2008 uh, as infants. They were, I think, a month old, and uh, they have been following, you know, these, these monkeys, and uh, they see a similar uh, decline in lung function of these monkeys. And we are coming from the exosome perspective to show, you know, there are any changes, uh, you know, uh, as uh, there's a decline in this lung function. Then I have uh, this R002, the August, uh, which we are looking at uh, the corona fingerprints. I've not done much on the nano and would like to get back. So with that, I think I have come to the end of my talk and I would be happy to take any questions. Is, is, is in the, the wild uh, the flower that you can see. Me and my son, we sat down to count the petals. And this was very interesting because most of these petals are odd numbers. They start 13, uh, 15, 17, and so on and so forth. It's very rare to find something that is odd and even here, which is the, the one that I you know, put here. It's a 14 petal Coriopsis. And so when I mark a discovery, it's something like this, and it's very rare. Uh, but there are ways. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nagarshan. And uh, we will open the, the floor for questions from the people in, in the room and then we we'll move to the people online. So, any questions? Yes, there we go. So, you mentioned that you're interested in studying the role of uh, EVs in chronic disease. What, what do you have in mind there? So, most of my cohorts that I have access to are uh, uh, lung diseases. And so uh, that's that's the primary interest right now. And so looking at you know these individuals who develop plural disease, you know if there is a risk of developing uh, asbestosis or mesothelioma and so on and so forth. Well, that's, but how does uh, the EV fit into that? Exosomes as uh, you know uh, a resource for biomarkers to predict the uh, the development of. Uh, but you you said you are going to look at pathogenesis. Also yes. So uh, that's the uh, the grant that we are thinking about for in terms of lead and neurotoxicity. And so we have where you know what we want to understand is that exosomes secreted by lung cells or the gut cells, you know, can they reach the central nervous system? And what kind of effects would we see once they are taken up by the neural cells? But you're focused. I mean, why would they have an effect? I, I mean, you've been you said you're focused on surface proteins and, and maybe proteins they're carrying. Um, so what, do you have a particular hypothesis about what it is you expect might be? Right, with the, with the uh, lead story, what we observe is that these vesicles actually are uh, you know, enriched with uh, heavy metals as well. And so uh, well, lead and metal. Really Where do heavy metals come from? Um, so if you expose uh, a cell to a metal, you know, and the cell that has taken up this metal uh, secretes exosomes. The metal ends up in the exosomes. Yeah, that's what we observed. Following up on that point, are they preferentially excreting the metals in the exosomes compared to what's in the endoplasm? We don't know that. We don't know. And uh, first of all, we need to show, uh, you know, their ultrastructural localization within the exosomes, are they surface bound, are they inside, and which uh, proteins they're bound to, and so on and so forth. So we have all these questions to address, and we are working on it with the uh, Sandia laboratories. Just, just to add to this complexity, I mean, we published a paper last year with my collaborators from the University of Sydney, uh, in this, and we have found even the isolation protocol affects the molecular content. And more interesting, even if you're going to use optical or non optical methods to characterize them, you know, that you get completely different results. So, how do you, uh, I mean, where is the field in terms of uh, standardizing these methodologies and protocols? Because if we, if each group is using different isolation protocol, it gets different results. Right. Uh, what are your thoughts on So, we have been relying on size explosion chromatography, which is less harsh 
on exosomes if you went the ultra centrifugation route. And, and so we have been relying on um, uh, size explosion. Um, so which is a little bit delicate. It doesn't rupture the membranes. It doesn't you know, change the exosome profiles dramatically. So, but we have not done a comparative study looking at it. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you the paper. So the problem with size though, pardon me, is that as you said, it's no longer considered an adequate uh, criteria by itself for excess, the EVs for any of the micro right, microparticles. Right, right. So you might, in fact, have a mixed population. That's correct. That's correct. But uh, with size explosion chromatography, you know, the population that we are seeing is highly enriched. That's why it's only enriched. But yes, you cannot completely have uh, an exosome population and exclude the microvessel. Yeah, so that's what I was going to follow up on. Uh -huh. um, just because it meets a size fraction, even a molecular weight fraction, right. doesn't verify that it's a, an exosome. That's and right. what, so what is your further validation that you're actually dealing with an exosome population right. as opposed to something that works, that weighs, you know, 300 kilodaltons or right. 500 megadaltons, five megadaltons or whatever else, you know? Now, people have been taking you know, different routes. So, for example, now that we know that there are all these markers, CD9, CD63, CD81, you know, people have been using immunocapture uh, V technology to isolate only these populations that are uh, positive for these membrane markers. But you are narrowed down to focus only on that. And you cannot apply that to a large scale population split like ours. So there are challenges, and it depends it, on the question that you want. It also to seems to be somewhat cyclic in that you start with a fraction you believe is the EVs. That's correct. And then you look for markers. Right. They are the EVs. Right. And then you use those markers to say, I got the same marker That's here, correct. which you might not have an EV at all. You right. might just have something of the right size and weight. Right. You know? Yeah, that's the characterization. Yeah. Constantly, you're going to use something out of no and, and can I follow up with another question? <laughs> and, and not to, not to, disparage anything that you said, but when you're, when you're, when you're, from a cran point of view, when you're talking about biomarker discovery, which is key, great field, mm -hmm. EVs might be a great thing, well, but how do you convince someone that the EV of a lead-exposed population is better than lead as a biomarker? Right. So, uh, you know, we, we study that uh, we've been looking at, you know, as I said, uh, as the stock exposure, for example. Right. Um, right. Blood is not being resourced uh, to uh, quantify uh, anthracytes. And you cannot do that in tissues. Uh, it's not feasible. And so we need to look at you know, biomarkers. I, 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 I agree. Something like asbestos is a That's decidedly it. different model. That's it. But lead, you can just lead. measure lead. That's it. Lead is you know, a pretty safe problem. But then, you know, some of this lead ends up in CNS. So how would you quantify you know, levels that have accumulated in brain in a pediatric population. Well, I so there's a challenge, and that's I, why you know, we have been interested in, in finding biomarkers. And uh, Andy Bakrilla's group, you know, has been studying epigenetic markers, especially in elderly population, looking at uh, lead and lead levels in the bone, and then uh, trying to correlate it with uh, these epigenetic markers. So, so let me let me see if I can take you down another pathway and right. see if you you would see value in this. You say that you believe the EVs shed the metals at a potentially greater rate than, than cells. Do you believe that years after the exposure is stopped and you've come to equilibrium concentrations and the bone is shedding a little bit of the blood and whatever else, mm -hmm. that you might have a more sensitive biomarker of lead exposure dating back to a, a, a longer term? Because the biggest problem with the exposome is the ability to measure something that happened 20 years ago and try and calculate. Do you believe that the EVs may be that pathway to historical exposure as opposed to a, a, an x ray of, of tibia or tibia or something like that? Now, just to give an example, now the Berlin study that I presented, these were individuals that were exposed you know, 20 years ago and the samples were archived and been also collected recently. And so right. we processed them and still the signature is there. And so that's why we rely on exosomes because one, they are originating in the cells. Right. Uh, and as long as the toxic end is there in the cell, then you can expect some other blood uh, change. But is the, is the signature still there 20 years later when you can no longer measure the beryllium concentration? Yes, that is correct. Yes, okay. is so, so, so you do have a, a memory of, of that exposure. Is okay. Yes. And is this applies to metals only? Have you 
look at organics and other toxins or <laughs> the maybe maybe montana uh, cohort they were exposed as uh, as children to asbestos and they're looking you know 20 30 years down the lane for these markets in these populations okay. yeah more questions from the audience before we open the, the floor to the people online? No questions? Any questions from the audience uh, on Zoom? Uh, please identify yourself and ask a question. I don't have a computer here. Don't put it in the chat room because I won't be able to read it. So, well, I guess no questions from there the are audience. No, there are no questions in the chat, Phil, uh, but people can unmute themselves and ask questions if they wish. I kept my talk brief because I believe that the hearing capacity for India is not more than 47 minutes. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, Mike, could you yeah. go back to that histogram you showed? It's yeah. about? Okay. Go, stop. Uh -huh. What does CD43 do? So, that's considered to be an act. Neutrophil. It's a marker for activated neutrophil. Actually, it's also a marker for activated monocytes. Monocytes. So this this profiling was done by an immunologist in our group, such an Molik. And so I'm not an immunologist, but I can certainly ask that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. If there are no more questions, uh, let's thank Nagarjun for his uh, talk and look forward to. No, 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 no,